So what? <laughs> regardless of any of the things that these guys sent me to say about them, the important thing is that we have a venue promoter who's going to be getting your press kits and bios. We've got a local publicly funded radio station, Scotty Robertson, WNCW, which is one of the main heartbeats of this region. And then we have two national brands. So you have local, regional, corporate entities who can talk on all of those levels. And I think one thing that Asheville forgets to do is to put its big boy hat on, that we are, it's so awesome here, we don't think about us and our art in the context of the United States of America. So that's what we're hoping to, we're good. These guys are gonna teach us how to show the rest of the country how good we are. Did anybody come to this event last year, last summer? Handful. So it goes without saying that we, you need a press kit. There are dozens, there are tons of assets online you can use to make a press kit that you can share with folks like this. That's what we talked about last year. Bio, press kit, I mean bio, headshot, recordings, broadcast quality stuff. You know, the technology has come so far in the last even five to seven years so that all of this is at your fingertips. If you have questions about how to build and create an effective, viable press kit, my name's Josh. Look, go to AshevilleMusicProfessionals.com and email me or any one of the board members on there and we'll work with you. I'll help you write a bio. You know, we can get it done pretty easily. What we want to talk about today and kind of focus on is what, once you've got that stuff together, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to get it in these guys' hands? And what are they going to do with it? And what are they expecting you from you? All right? Cool? All right, word. So one of the things um, that comes to mind first, guys, emerging trends in media. Uh, when I was a touring musician in the late 90s and early 2000s, making a demo was very difficult and getting it to you guys was it required FedEx and shit like that. Um, some of that still works, some of it doesn't. What still works, what doesn't? What are you guys seeing as things that an up and coming artist with a, a local following or a regional following should adhere to? What should they discard? What are, the, what are the high level things that these guys need to put in their, in their arsenal and, and stow away as, as radio broadcast professionals? Scotty, let's start with you. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Um, as a, as a non-com, um, WNCW is a, is a unique animal. Um, and I'm sure we'll be able to flesh this out between my, my commercial brothers here to my right. Um, we have a lot more latitude in, in accepting material. So WNCW in its unique position as a, radio, as a music centric uh, entity in, in public broadcasting, um, we're very, very fortunate. We have a terrestrial signal that covers five states and of course, uh, worldwide streaming. So a lot of people want to use um, our voice as a way to move your art forward. Um, what, that, uh, what that ultimately means is that we are inundated with music. And over the years, we've seen um, the numbers continue to grow as, uh, as recording has become so much easier for folks. I can, I can tell you, um, being on the receiving end of so much of this material, uh, we get, if you've ever seen those big mailbox things that, you know, that the post office uses to collect and carry mail, we, we get one or two of those a day that are stuffed with uh, CDs. And that doesn't even reflect the amount of um, digital media that we're receiving through the email. We still operate uh, predominantly in CD, but we are moving progressively into a more, a more digital realm. But the bottom line is, uh, the material that you're getting to a radio station, um, the, the recording has to be as, as beautiful and clean and fresh 
uh, as you can possibly make it. If you're putting it on in email and it's coming, you know, digitally, um, you know, having the option of, of placing it in there in a couple of multiple forms, you know, maybe Flack and maybe, uh, you know, in WAV files. Um, these are all good because it gives uh, music and program directors options. Uh, it, the music is the first thing for a music director and a program director. Uh, but if you have a really intriguing and interesting one sheet that, uh, that gives material succinctly and the correct material, so uh, you know, track listings and, and actual timings, maybe a, a couple of paragraphs short about, uh, about your material, the people that you worked with uh, in your band or outside of that, um, that's, the one sheet is a, an important little way to introduce yourself uh, to the radio station. Um, those, those are the, that's the bedrock stuff right there. If you're, if you're covering that, you're doing pretty well. Um, and, and I'm hogging the mic, so we'll pass it on. I think hearing from Mark and Nikki also about the difference between national presence, regional presence, what sort of assets. Uh, thanks, Scotty, that was awesome. You know, I think for, for me on a corporate side of radio, um, I don't even really like to think of it as corporate radio. You know, yeah, our formats are kind of locked into place, but, you know, for me on a news talk station, I kind of have the same latitude in a sense because I really control the content for at least my own show, and I control the content for the news as well. So in Asheville, um, I'll give you for example, I moved here from Orlando almost two years ago. There is no music scene in Orlando. What you have here in, in Asheville, most big cities don't even have this vibrant of a music scene. So to, to be inside that now and look back at the time I spent living in Orlando, which is a massive city, there is no arts and entertainment there. It's all corporate cookie cutter, strip mall. There's no Gray Eagle. There's nothing like that. So to be here in Asheville, you know, be, feel fortunate as a musician because it, it really is a great scene. But um, you know, for me, I can, I have spots where I can put it, even though it's a news talk station. Um, I use bump music coming in from every commercial break. So if you have digital music that you can send me, then, and it's local, then that kind of adds a story for me in a sense, because it also gives me a local tie to my listeners that there's local musicians. So it's there, yeah, it's a corporate radio station, but the music that you're hearing is all sourced locally. The information is all sourced locally. So there's a certain roots aspect to it. Um, our music stations are a little bit differently. They don't quite have the latitude to play local music. Um, some, some will have local music shows, uh, but for the most part, our two talk products, which would be News Radio 570 and then 880 The Revolution, um, Jeff Messer does a fantastic job on 880 The Revolution in the afternoons, really highlighting local artists and local talent. And, and it's not so much a news-based show by any stretch. It's really more arts and entertainment than it is anything. So you're going to get music and theater and everything else. Um, as far as the marketing aspect, for me, I hate getting things in the mail. Hate it. It's just because I have so much stuff that's always coming in. If I can get like a great digital media kit, that's the, that is the greatest asset for me because it's something that I don't have to keep track of. I know where it is. It's in my email. And I can pull it up in the studio. Um, you know, one of the things we do on Fridays is like we do an entire segment on Fridays at six minutes on beer because beer is Asheville. I mean, we call it the bruise news. Uh, yeah, we talk about everything else throughout the morning, but you know, it's an important part of Asheville is to talk about the bruise news. But we want to try to start moving into getting local musicians to come into our show and play the bump music live from six to nine in the morning. So that's kind of the direction that we're going. So like the digital assets for us is really a big thing as far as the uh, as far as sending your material in, um, and just have you know have a great one sheet. I think that's the other really big thing is don't put useless information on there. You know, like who, what, when, why, where that type of thing. Hey, Nikki, can you? I know I've been in both Clear Channel Studios and uh, Asheville Radio Group and Saga as a musician mm -hmm. because of benefits or different events going on, and that's since that's one of your main focuses. Can you talk a little bit about how, if any of these guys in here are involved in an event mm -hmm. that might need local coverage, what's a, in addition to what the other question was? <laughs> I'm not even sure if I remember what the question was. But um, 
I think uh, what I bring to the table is a little bit different. Um, I'm the director of marketing for that cluster of radio stations. So um, the information that I'm going to give or share is really universal with regard to marketing. And, um, you know, one thing that Josh alluded to when he was talking about the bio that I sent in is I represent six brands, uh, different radio brands. So your dial, 98.1 The River, as a brand is different than 105.9 The Mountain, which is a classic rock station, 98.1 The River being a very, we call it dull alternative, which may mean nothing to you, but it's you know, new music, also some deep cuts from classic um, musicians, also ESPN talk radio. So if I'm wearing my marketing hat, I'm not going to market those brands the same way. So for you as a musician, you should be wearing your marketing hat to think of what are all the ways that I can market my brand, my music, and how is that going to stand out? Um, you know, so sending your material, you want the audience. So for you, if that audience is the venue and the talent buyer or your audience is, if it comes to me, you're, you're sending your information to a promotions director, a marketing director, not a brand manager, um, you know, which these guys probably are for their respective brands on the air. Within a radio station, you're going to have people wearing multiple hats. Um, these people are, you know, radio stations are lean and mean these days. Um, you know, so, yeah, exactly. I mean, I sell advertising. I also, you know, in marketing, I manage all of our events. Brand managers are doing music programming as well as representing the digital footprint for these particular brands. So, um, you know, that's probably not what they did 20 years ago in radio. They are now responsible for a lot of things. So you want to be definitely succinct to, so to Scotty's point. Um, and also, what is in it for me, the audience? So I have to be honest here. I hate the blanket stock email that goes to every radio station ever. Know your audience. If you are sending me a demo or an idea, hey, I'd love to play an event, um, you know, and I'm a bluegrass musician, you know, hey, I love your station, ESPN Radio. You look that up online and know it doesn't, it doesn't jive. So think about, you know, if you can go ahead and connect the dot for me of I'm a local musician, I specialize in, you know, bluegrass or, you know, I'm really into the singer-songwriter thing. I love 98 One The River and that, you've already connected the dot for me who manages six brands what you're already engaged with, and it feels individual. It doesn't feel like spam. Um, because again, everybody is inundated with messages all day long, regardless of what industry that you're in. Um, so I would really um, take that extra step to go to the, to the radio station that if you could envision your song being played, our clients are our listeners. I can't play hard rock on 98 One The River. I mean, you, you can't. Um, and we do have local programming. And while there might be a singer-songwriter who has, you know, nice, cool riffs and a good electric guitar, if that matches, it's ultimately up to the brand manager to get that out to her client, which are the listeners. Um, I can't play, uh, you know, alternative kind of moody emo on Mix 96.5. It's pop. You know, so know what you're after and be direct in what you're asking for. If you think you're a good fit for a specific brand that I represent, hey, Nikki, comma, and then you put your message in. You know, I, I would love to either play an event. You know, your brand can not only be on the radio, but it can also be live, one-on-one -on -one marketing and having a touch point with a potential, um, you know, client of yours, which would be a listener who might buy your CD or follow you on Instagram or SoundCloud or whatever. You know, those are, that's your audience. Um, tell me what your, what your market already is. Do you have... 5,000 followers on Facebook because at the end of the day, you know, if you aren't paying to promote yourself, you're asking me to put myself out there with my clients. And, you know, I want to know, well, if I sponsor your show or I give tickets away, you know, what, how will I say 98 won the river to, you know, wh where, where is that going to go? Does that make sense? I hope, um, you know, as far as um, the social marketplace and grassroots marketing, it sometimes can be beneficial for my brand to support your brand if it makes sense mutually. 
Um, so that would be, you know, um, my two cents on the marketing. And then as far as assets, 98 One The River is certainly um, the brand that I represent that has the best local tie-in. We have a local show that's on air on Sunday nights called Homegrown. And Heather Anders, who's our brand manager, that's exclusively local programming. She loves getting CDs, whereas I'm a person who likes that individual email. Um, she wants a CD. If you send her brownies or confetti in the packaging or anything sweet, that's your girl right there. So that's that's a little inside tip on Heather. She, Yeah, exactly. Not even bribes, just anything different that jumps out of the page. Being creative. Um, you know, they do. They do. And then we also do Studio AVL. So Heather is our afternoon drive host on the river and um, she... I mean, absolutely lives and breathes. She is the heartbeat of that radio station. So um, even addressing her by name in an email is going to get you miles ahead of the spam-like email. Um, but we cover local musicians, regional musicians, and national touring acts. So again, if it's in line with our demo, which that particular station is, um, you know, Grace Potter comes through Studio AVL or Amos Lee or G Love. And then um, we also host events. And that is a little bit more my wheelhouse. We promote a um, summer concert series, which is all local musicians. That's another great way to enhance your brand. If it's not getting on the radio, maybe that's a goal. But another goal would be, hey, you know what? I play events. I've got some awesome choice covers that are crowd favorites. Plus, I've got my own original music. Tell me how I can help connect the dots versus reading the email that sounds like it could go to any station in USA. Thank you, I'm done. <laughs> so, to, a little bit on, on what Nikki was saying, guys. I've worked in publicity and marketing for a long time. I've also been a musician. One of the best things that I learned as an expansion on knowing your audience, do not send a blanket email to, to these guys and expect a great response. If you listen to their show, be like, hey, Heather, Nikki, dude, whatever. I listened to your show and I really like what you had to say about this person. You also played this artist and I kind of sound a lot like that. Yeah. That means you're, you're paying attention to them. They're people, media folks are people too, you know. Just remember that. So you might have a great canned email, but when I'm getting, when I'm doing a press release and I've, you know, I've done local, regional, national and gotten coverage and all of it, it's because I researched the reporter, I read their shit, and I say something pertinent to them and make it relevant. You have to make yourself relevant. So what's one thing that all these guys just said? Make yourself relevant. How are you standing out from the crowd? What are your metrics? What can you do for them? And where do you fit? Because the more thinking they have to do, bye-bye. See ya. Goes, that email goes right in the trash once they think that you're rambling because there's 28,000 more emails that they're not going to get to. So they have to... People, we got it. This is a fast-moving world. Unfortunately, I'm sure you've all got a great story, but nobody wants to hear about the song about the girl that broke your heart and left you in Michigan with the bus station. It's, I don't know. We don't care. It's the thing. Now, Benton, can you talk about digital footprint um, or start us off? Nikki brought that up when you, as a venue guy, you know, like we we kind of talked about how it was. Recording a demo was really difficult, and you know it doesn't matter what genre of music you were, you have to get something recorded and then submitted. And as a venue person and a festival guy who's booked all kinds of different acts, all kinds of different genres, um, what what do you want to see um, from a from the assets as well as a digital footprint? And then that assets and digital footprint guys would be the just go back down the line. All right, well, first, thank you for having me, Josh and Amp. And uh, secondly, you should start having Scotty Robertson write your bio. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and make yourself accessible. First of all, yes, I get a million emails a day, uh, almost an exaggeration. And I can't tell you how many of them I don't even take the time, because obviously you didn't take the time. Not meaning you specifically, but if you don't have proper links, you shouldn't send a booking agent an email saying, I would love to play your venue. Well, that sounds awesome. Um, 
I would love for you to play my venue if you're good. I can't tell you how many bands have had crappy materials, but they had one quality venue of quality sound, and I immediately gave them a shot because they sounded great. So before you even get to the point of the bio or the links, make sure you're honing your skill. Make sure you have that skill, and make sure you are concentrated on yourself. Your brand is only a reflection of what you actually are. You certainly don't want to put something out there that's a lie. So first of all, be a musician, be an artist, um, and be different. You know, it's one thing to align yourself with other bands. I mean, I may deal with a Dr. Dog show where we're going to buy Facebook ads and we're going to tag five other bands of a similar genre. So it's okay to align yourselves. That's natural to the industry. Uh, to, to tie that quickly to, to your previous question about how do you use a, a nonprofit benefit potentially as a platform, well, that's basically using your community as a platform. And I can't tell you how many artists I specifically am just not a fan of, but they had a huge platform because they had a huge community. You know, sometimes you see people that are very famous, you don't really understand why they're famous. Well, it's because they had a lot of people like them and a lot of people following them. Whether you understand that or not, that's insignificant. So starting at your, the most grassroots thing, which is the guy sitting next to you, if you can only get Josh to come to one show and you play five shows a year and he only comes to one, well, that means he's your friend, but that may not mean he's your fan. Once you get a number of people who come into all five of those shows, now all of a sudden, those are the people you need to talk to first. And then you need to get them behind you, and then you need to get your materials together to go talk to these guys. You know, so first of all, focus on your, on your art. And second of all, make sure that you have a clean profile. Whether it's a Facebook page, a website, make sure all these materials are consistent. Make sure they tell your story without being boring. You know, like Josh said, you know, once you're a big artist, they do want to hear about that one song and what led to writing that. But until then, they want to know why they should remember you. Uh, so make sure you're you first and that'll be the easiest part to remember. Um, other than that, you know, it's hard to say the resources to certain materials are better than others because some of that's based on budgets, accessibility, whether or not you have a manager, an agency, a web designer, you know, uh, and those are tough things. Right now, technology is at your fingertips, so it's really about honing in a couple of materials, using them wisely, and, you know, using them to make yourself look clean and good and make sure it's a direct reflection of who you are, which hopefully is an amazing artist. Excellent. And back to me. Digital footprint, Digital footprint right. Um, I think what Ben said was like spot on. And the only thing I can add on to that is to make sure you're current. Um, I can't tell you, especially in researching um, artists or bands or performers for events that I produce, you know, you go on their Facebook page or, you know, their website and the last track comes up from like 2013. I'm like, are these guys really sound like this? Do they really look like this? Is this what they're still wearing? I mean, you again, it's your brand. You want it to be up to date. And even if your best show is from 2013, put that in the sidebar and say, here's where I played last week. Or, you know, I'm currently not touring because of X or Y or whatever. But you want it to be fresh and new and... Um, topical for what people are looking for right now. People, digital is changing. It changed five minutes ago. So you want to make sure that you are very much on that if you're going to have a digital footprint. And if you're not, if that's something you can't maintain, then just don't. Have a splash page with your information on it. Very easy. Contact me here and send send the great performance that's on a CD that doesn't have a, a stamp of time and date. You know, it's really just that audio quality. Um, um, that's not a problem, but people are going to research you online. That's what they're going to do. Um, they're going to listen. They're going to see how marketable you might be because a lot of these things are cross-promotional. You know, will my brand match your brand? And that's what, um, you know, from a commercial radio station perspective, you know, we're looking at. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Makes sense to me. Perfect. Go to that. I want to add one more thing um, back onto the Facebook thing. And as much as we're going to research you when you send us our kits you should be researching us just as much. Um, when it comes to sending, it's like that blanket email, it's kind of like the same thing when you get that letter from the collections department, you're like, oh, just throw that over the shoulder, that's useless. <laughs> so go on my Facebook page, like look me up on Facebook or look me up on Twitter or Instagram or go to wwnc.com and read my bio or look and see what I'm into and then 
throw something in that email to kind of break that ice so that I have a reason to want to talk, you know, to want to read on. Because a lot of times, I'll be honest, I get through one line of an email and I go, oh, just can't do this one, and it goes away. And it's usually because I'm a grammar hound. Like, if things are misspelled and it doesn't look right, or if things are in different fonts, it's like, wait a second, I, if this is the quality that I'm going to get out of your media package, then what is the quality that I'm going to get if I book you for an event? And that's really the big thing, because in a sense for corporate radio, we're putting our brand's reputation out there and gambling on artist performances. And luckily enough, we live in Asheville, there's some fantastic artists, there's so many fantastic artists here. But in a lot of places, radio stations are very hesitant to work with local acts because they've been burned in the past. Right? I mean, if we're going to pay you 500 bucks to bring your three-piece band out to an event, uh, you kind of have to look at it and go, well, what am I getting aside from the money? Where's the value in that aside from the money? Uh, moving back to the digital footprint, if, like I said before, if the more that you have, the more videos that you have, or the more reaction that you have, you know, if someone on your Facebook page you know, put a bunch of comments about a show that you played and it were fantastic comments, screenshot that and figure out some way to incorporate that into your media kit. Because that's, that's me getting direct reaction from a fan who went to your show, who saw what you did, who saw your craft and was blown away by it. That's just gonna make me go, well, this is kind of like the same kind of people we have here in Asheville, so they're probably gonna dig this. Um, it's really important for you to do research on who you're targeting as well. Um, for me as a, as a talk station, it doesn't matter what kind of genre of music you are. I'll, I'll put anybody on, right? Because it's local, and as I said before, it's a story for, for us for the morning show. Benton and I worked together uh, last year when they were doing their summer concert series. Benton would call in on Friday morning, we'd do two or three minutes on the air about what show was coming up, and that's kind of like Benton's extra promise to artists that he's reaching out to do something that he didn't have to do. He didn't have to answer the phone at 7.40 in the morning when I called him. And I know he said horrible things about me as soon as we hung up the phone. But the fact of the matter is, is that he's got a brand to represent, and he's also got an artist brand that he's put his name out there for, and he's representing them as well. So you get a lot of extra added promotion that you might not even realize is there. Um, if you can get me your music, and it's air quality, and I think it's something that my listeners will enjoy, I'll put it into rotation for bump music in the morning times, and it'll get played at least once a morning. I mean, I probably use 35 different songs a morning coming in and out of commercial breaks. So there's 35 opportunities there for local artists to send me their music and get me their stuff. What he said. <laughs> um, you know, the bottom line is know your art and make sure that what you were putting out there is clean. There's going to be a temptation to want to participate in every social media platform. Uh, you know, if you can't keep it up, don't do it. Do what you do really, really well. And the, and the bottom line is your music, right? That's, the, that's you. So uh, make sure that that is your, your crossing the T's and dotting the I's and creating the best possible performance. Um, the remark about, you know, being uh, timestamp media... You know, old performances that you put up on your social media, uh, yeah, everybody smells that pretty quick. Make sure it's relevant and timely. Um, and I think probably, I know there's probably a lot of, a lot of artists out here that are, um, that are debating the use of uh, radio promotions people. And um, this ties in with knowing where your materials are going. Because there are so many uh, different formats in radio. You obviously don't want to be sending your bluegrass thing out to the Hard Rock station. So it takes a little uh, detective work on your part. For folks that, you know, you have some dollars to spend and you're considering uh, a radio promotions person, they're going to do some of that footwork for you. They're, they're going to listen to your work and determine what radio format is applicable to the thing that you're creating. And they will have a large list of names and stations that they can put your work um, in those offices. And you'll have an elevated chance of, of getting some exposure from those folks. But um, I think the, to repeat that thing, uh, 
you know, don't go where you're, you're not comfortable. Don't employ platforms that you, that you can't keep up or that you can't produce an effective product on and make sure it's timely. So. And don't put media packages on our windshields in the parking lot. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm really not kidding you. I walked out to the radio station in a parking lot and on my car, somebody has stuck a CD in a jewel case and it says, will you play this for me? I don't even know what it is. I don't know that it's not porn or something like that. I'm certainly not going to put it in a computer at work. Like, I mean, so... You That's can why in. you have an old school CD player too, <laughs> dude. In case it's porn. But you, you, yeah, but you could definitely drop it off at the front desk of a radio station. But the chances are that... And it's kind of like I said, we wear a lot of hats. I mean, we probably... I don't know anybody that works in radio that doesn't have like four different positions. So the chances are that we would have two to five minutes to meet with you right in the middle of the day unexpectedly, it's probably not that good. I mean, and that's just kind of how it is. It's nothing personal. It's just that our days are so segmented because you got to remember we're managing products that run second by second, and every second is crucial to us. So uh, it's, it's tough to get time, but if we're willing to give you time, if we call and we're willing to give you time, there's obviously a reason for it. There's obviously a good reason behind it. Um, that's a great information. Here's a quick segue. Um, Benton and Scotty, if you guys would address this next one. Can we talk about how venues and radio stations kind of create that synergy? And obviously, Nikki and, and Mark can chime in on this, but you know, obviously, WCW has Studio B and farms a whole lot of local and regional talent and sort of people are coming up the mountain and they stop in in Spindale and they come right up here and they play the Great Eagle or they play Isis or, or wherever it is. So can, can you guys talk about how you get into that feeder system um, and what best practices are of, of being considered for stuff like that? If you have live shows on the calendar. Yeah, I mean, probably to quickly speak for, for both Scotty and I, uh, twofold. One, you know, most press is supposed to be hot. So if you have an album coming out, that's the time to tap into those resources of say, I want to be in the studio, or I want to try to get some airplay, or you want to call in to, to a radio station, possibly do a phone or interview leading up to an event. And obviously if you have a booked show, you know, your promoter, your venue rep, uh, he's your tool and he also wants people to, to come to the show. So obviously he's gonna support that. Um, I think all that ties kind of back to the original point I made, which is, is your community. Because really the truth is we're all just doing the bidding of what people are going to come spend money to our facilities our, or support our entities, support our brands. So really, if you have your community built, whether it's devoting yourself to saying, hey, you know, I've got this project going, I'm going to put my materials out there for free online, whether it's Bandcamp, whatever it is, streaming, download. Um, putting yourself out there, getting your Facebook numbers up, your Instagram numbers up. By the time you come to those entities, you have something to show. You know? So once you get to the point of dealing with real, live, 24-hour media, dealing with venues of a larger nature, the Gray Eagle, for example, um, you're going to want to be already pretty far ahead of the game. You know? So your artistry is first, your community is a very close second. Um, you know, whether it's playing on your back porch every Thursday to friends or doing a jam at a local venue for free on, on Sundays, whatever it is, um, that allows you to kind of build about that. Um, I'll let Scotty elaborate. Once again, um, having the effective kit uh, and, a, and a background that demonstrates um, your professionalism and your art, uh, that's all very important. In, uh, Speaking for WNCW, um, it's kind of twofold for us in that uh, local and regional musicians uh, have a better shot at, at having a live session simply because uh, we feel it's part of our mission to reinforce uh, local art. So our, you know, our show, Local Color, does a great job of, uh, of showcasing local artists and uh, folks that may not have a whole lot of exposure previously we'll have a, an enhanced opportunity to perform in that theater. When we move to uh, our larger performance studio, which is a, I mean, it's a world-class recording studio, Studio B, um, 
we tend to um, have a bit of a line in the sand whereby folks that get an opportunity to play in that room uh, have, uh, have a pretty solid reputation. Uh, we've, uh, we've engaged their music uh, in rotation. It's been, a, it's been a part of our sound. Or uh, we feel really, really good about uh, something that, that they're bringing to the table immediately. Um, they've got a brand new uh, album out that there's been a lot of buzz about that we're hearing from uh, maybe some other radio stations, some other programmers, uh, and we feel like it would, it would fit in our diaspora. Um, so we're able to offer those live performance opportunities a bit more than, than commercial radio, but the same rules apply in that when you approach the program director or the music director or the brand director uh, and say, I really want to come in and do this thing, make sure that uh, you are really tidy, that, uh, that you have a, a great product to stick in their head because once again, you, you may only have a minute and a half uh, for somebody to review your thing and make a decision. So um, what we're coming back around here to is know your art and own it and be the best that you possibly be at whatever it is that you're doing. So. Uh, to that end, I, I want a quick note. I have seen bands in this town, relatively unknown, get the fuck after it, pardon my French, with promotions, booking, and making a hell of a product and have gone with them into Studio B to play a session and come back up the hill and sell out a room up here. Yep. And that comes to how hard you guys want to work. Once you've got the product, that's great. Anybody can send an email. If you write good music, you, high quality production, and you are aggressive and you beat the street, you do that once, you create a following, you are super aggressive in getting into these rooms and getting, them, getting people in there, these guys might even come to you. But if you're, if you're just expecting it to happen, it's not. The first time you have to build that following, you've got to be aggressive. You've got to get people to come see you. And in a town like this, it's hard uh, because there's a lot of talent and there's a lot of rooms. But art will win. So for, like, I think everybody keeps going back to that. Art's going to win. Make good product. Be aggressive. Once you get on these venues' radar, ask Benton. Once he knows about you, you don't have to get aggressive. You don't have to be as aggressive. Yes, promote your shows, but you're already on yeah, the radars. You're we're listening. There. We're listening. And know your window, you know, to go back to kind of pointing, okay, I'm going to play a benefit for a nonprofit. Well, at Pisgah, I utilize a lot of nonprofit sponsorships and tie-ins as almost a way to get extra press, you know, not just because, I mean, truly, we want to build our community just like I'm preaching to you, because um, that grassroots, that people, that's the aspect of what marketing is. We're just an avenue, you know, whether it's radio or online, Facebook, whatever it is. But knowing your window, so say you're, work, you're playing for a benefit that you know has some press behind it, has some sponsors behind it, has a couple of radio stations, perhaps Nikki's planning that event, that's a window. That's your chance to go after that opportunity. Let's say you're opening for a really big band in a market and you go to a you know, second level market radio station who doesn't have the big band on, on, on the air for them that day, but they could have you, the opener, and they still get to talk about that big band. That's a window. You know, using those opportunities where you're aligning yourself with something else happening and being able to put yourself on a platform. Um, and yeah, and acting like a professional and knowing when there's a window and when there's not. You know, sometimes beating down the door can be annoying. So. <laughs> Uh, I suggest picking those, those very wisely um, because it makes it more impactful. Can I chime in one thing? Please. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, the only other thing I would piggyback on that is um, a lot of, because this is a small town, we pretty much all know each other. So, um, you know, if, if you're on Benton's radar, I produce events, I pick up the phone and I'm going to call Benton and say, hey, I've got to need, I need an opener for Bacon Fest or whatever the case may be. He, the people that I know that book music, 
um, is, is a, you want to make sure that you keep bridges open and that you're a professional and, um, you know, work every angle that you have. Another tip would be um, a lot of venues have relationships with radio stations. So when you book that show at the Great Eagle or at Pisgah, you know, and maybe you're talking a bit and say, hey, do you have any relationships with media? Um, you know, if he's got a relationship with the river and he's already a client of our station, you are way more likely to get love on our station. If it aligns with our audience, you know, that's the big caveat. Um, you know, if you send an email and say, hey, we're booking at Pisgah, understand that they're a partner with your, you know, of yours, you're going to get further in the door that way. So ask the question. I think that's totally, um, you know, a viable thing to do. And, um, you know, work the network as much as you can um, because he might be too busy to pick up the phone. Um, but if you can do that legwork for him, it could make a win win for everyone. Yeah, one of the other great great resources and it's a way for you to be able to help market yourself but also to be able to give back because that's that's also part of it right is being able to give back so if there's a charity out there that that you're passionate about uh, for me it's it's helios warriors or it's it's vfw or it's any veterans organization tie in with them go offer your craft or your services for their event if they're having a you know a for instance, if they're having like a, a Veterans Honor Day out at the VA, you know, a lot of times gigs aren't going to pay, but it's the FaceTime and you can pick up a few more friends and you've tied yourself in with a group that you're helping to give back to that organization and that organization will call on you in the future. And they'll say, hey, listen, we've got an event coming up. We'd love you to come and play. But it's just as important and it doesn't make it any less of an event because it's for a nonprofit or for a, a charity or whatever it is. But there's, there's so many organizations in this town that you can tie yourself in with and they're constantly throwing events and there's always room for music. I think that's, that's one thing that you can be assured of in Asheville when it comes to an event for a charity is that there's always room for music. Uh, even with some of the races and the marathons, we constantly are taking our vans down on the weekends and they'll say, hey, can you just set up at the, the starting line and play music for two hours? Why couldn't that be a local artist down there? I mean, it doesn't have to be radio stations. I mean, it, that's an opportunity for you to say, okay, wait a second, I'm going to go find some race directors, and maybe you can play the after party, um, kind of like they do for the Asheville uh, Half Marathon. Just some other options for you to think about is tying in with some local groups that are nonprofits and being able to give back a little, and you get a little push at the same time. In a city that is this competitive, do you guys need any any uh, leg up that you can get. And having worked PR and marketing and nonprofits and for bands and for start a nonprofit that was a hybrid of the two, I've actually watched local startup bands get a good gig at a good benefit, play in front of a thousand people they wouldn't otherwise get exposed to, and then they're in Studio B playing Pisgah, doing radio remotes for either one of these guys. So. That is one avenue. I'm not saying you need to give the farm away and not charge and maybe do a free gig once in a while for these guys, but ingratiate yourself to as many different networks as you can. And this is a town that really, 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 really embraces activism and nonprofits. It has the second largest nonprofits per capita in the country. So that's a great way to get to crowds. One more quick topic. We're going to bring up uh, Noah Guthrie for the Q&A. Um, so be mindful of some questions you guys might want to ask. Um, artists struggle with money, budgets. Radio so, people struggle with money. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. This is uh, coming from iHeartMedia over there. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. But seriously, resources are limited. We're, we all know that, we've okay, so we've got the gig. We got a little exposure. We got a little scratch in our pocket. What's the most effective way to make use of that? If I've got a reputation in town, if I'm an artist, artist, I need a, a few more people coming to my shows. I, I would like to maybe get some regional exposure on the airwaves. What's the most effective and efficient way in this age of social media to, to drop some money? Is it buying Facebook ads for, for my show? Is it working with a publicist? Is it talking to you guys and saying, here's 500 bucks? blow up my next show you know how does from venue to to the radio stations how do you guys view the, the best way to do that 
that's a t that's actually kind of a tough question in a sense. Like, I wouldn't. I mean, I don't know if you're making money out there and you're looking to advertise. Yeah, you would want to use a medium, but at the same time, you know, it's it's going to be just as effective for if you're playing a big event or if there's a show in town. If you're playing bluegrass or whatever you might be playing. Um, we pull people in from these events all the time on a weekly basis to have them come in on the morning show and talk for five to ten minutes about the event. If there's musicians, we'll have the musicians play live. Um, I think you just kind of have to look for unique opportunities that aren't going to break your bank. Uh, you know, if you're working with a $500 budget, I mean, that, that's kind of a tough, that's a pretty small advertising budget to work okay, with. Okay, so you got I'm 100 for posters impossible. and you got to hang some posters, and we all know the posters might be going the way of the Dodo Bird, but. <laughs> Get me a great. A, a there... great photo of your of the band or a great uh, venue poster that has the event on it and that goes on our dig that goes on our digital sites on our websites it goes on six of them and it lives there for the entire month that that event is planned and it gets socialed out through Twitter and through Facebook on all of our station sites so it's it's kind of uh, I don't want to say it's a hit or miss marketing but that event will get socialed out at some point in time prior to the event on all six of our station's social media pages and reposted to the website and brought back up to the top of the front page, that type of thing. So, um, I mean, that's, that's pretty much the best that I've, that I've got. I just, I don't know that I'd go and blow a whole lot of money on Facebook ads if you haven't seen a real great result from them in the past. I know a lot of people that I've talked to have gotten burned from Facebook ads because they're just not getting the reach that they wanted out of it. Um, and make sure you're targeting the right audience. You know, if, if you're in a metal band, probably no sense in sending a Facebook notice to 65-year-olds because they're not going to go, right? I mean, if you're a Beatles cover band, you're barking up the right tree at that point. So I, I think it's really just doing your research and knowing your target audience and knowing where you're going to get the most bang for your buck. That wouldn't hurt. Yeah. Um, I think the only thing I, I would add to that from just a marketing general perspective, whether you're a client coming to me that says, hey, I've got $20,000 to spend on an advertising campaign, or I'm a musician who's got $500 to spend, what is the result that you're looking to achieve? So, I mean, I'm not just going to take your money blanketly um, without a goal. What is the goal in mind? Do you want to drive Facebook likes? Is that the end result? I don't care who shows up at the Great Eagle to watch my show, but my goal is to build my Facebook fan base. Then maybe $500 is well spent on Facebook advertising. Um, is your goal to get people in the door at the Great Eagle and you've only got a couple hundred dollars to spend, then maybe post and you know, buying your friends a six pack of beer and hustling the streets is the best option. Um, I really think that having a tangible goal in mind of what you're trying to achieve at the end of the day is a strong bet. And unfortunately, marketing and advertising is the absolute hardest thing to gauge at the end of the day. And if you have no clear goal, and you're like, hmm, I hope people will like my show, that's super vague, and you're probably at the end of the day going to blow your money on anything that you do. So, um, you know, writing those things down, talking to people who do this for a living, I think is smart. Um, you know, if your craft is music and art, talk to someone who does marketing. Talk to someone who does social media and, and how that particular medium is the most effective for what you're trying to achieve. Um, because it, you might just want to save your money. Um, or you might be needing to spend more in certain avenues based on the goal that you're trying to achieve and where you are in your craft. Um, you know, I think everybody's place is different and not everything works for everyone the same way. What does, what does success look like to you, mm -hmm. right? What's the event and what's a successful result? And then, then draw your map from there. Yeah, it, once again, you know, we can say the same thing 10 different ways, but it, it, you need to know yourself We're very and you need to know that, that one thing that you're trying to gain right now. So if it is build the Facebook page, then maybe that's the thing. But, you know, for so many performing artists, maybe the root is not just money. Maybe it's about your performance, you know. So that means circulate and you need to you need to know every venue that you can in a region. You need to know all the other players that you could possibly meet. 
you know, that, that circle of community between performers and venues and radio station is, is are, it's very tight. So the more that you can insert yourself into these, these circles of personalities, the more you're gonna be known. And, uh, and then opportunities arise that may not cost you any money whatsoever. There's, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of folks out there that are spending a lot of money trying to build themselves on social media. And there have been great careers made that way. I tend to believe that the art is, is the heart of the mother, right? And so if you have a, a beautiful thing, if you have a, a really outstanding knack at songwriting, if you can construct beautiful melodies and you just consistently put them out there, you have a, you have a good reasonable chance of making a connection with somebody. Now that may be, you, you're gonna have to look a little closer at what it is you're after, right? So taking a shotgun approach to every radio station is not gonna work. But maybe if you're a singer songwriter and you can identify those radio stations that are all about singer songwriters, yeah, that's a good step. Then narrow it down a little, a little bit more. Then you've got to find the contact there and try to make a personal connection with that contact in that uh, radio station. So you know, it's, it sounds overwhelming to a certain degree, but the reality is we're just gonna keep beating you up about this. Make your art and make it the best that you possibly can and be connected with as many people as you can. You know, don't, you know, don't just sit in your, in your living room and play your guitar. Exactly, Go, go nice. out and take your guitar with you because that chance to jump up on a stage may well happen tonight, you know? Go do the open jams. Go and participate in the brown bag songwriting competition, Busk. right? Busk, by all means. We live in one of the great busking cities in the United States, right? It's, at least currently. So <laughs> take advantage of this while it's still, it's still out there. But, um, but ultimately, you know, you're your own best friend and you know, the old adage, know thyself. So know what you want and start to narrow that, that window down to where you want to direct your energies at. None of this is genre specific either. One no. thing we there's two takeaways, and then we got we're going to introduce Noah and, and start a QA session. First, what we kept hearing tonight is create a good product. Don't half-ass it. There's so many tools that are so accessible to people right now to make a decent broadcast quality recording. Have it work on your writing, work on your performing, your mixing your arrangements, whatever it is you do, do it as best you can and don't jump the gun. Secondly, make a plan for the year. One thing that we didn't talk about yet, yes, know what your goal is for spending that money, but hopefully you have a, that in a context of do it, break it up in a quarters or years or whatever. This year, I wanna be playing these festivals or be playing them by next year because you gotta book festivals way the fuck out, you know? Have, have, have this plan. It takes a while, guys, to get the exposure. And you're not going to meet all your goals, but you're going to get an opportunity, and you're going to be able to plug that into this plan on this calendar date. And you're like, okay, I've got my recording ready. And wow, I met this guy showing up at the open mic and playing the brown bag competition. And show up, like, just like they said, man, show up. That's half of it in this town. You meet the right person, you just pushed fast forward on your communications plan. But if you don't get out, if you don't put yourself out there in a strategic, strategic way, I can't emphasize that enough. If you're not strategic, these guys aren't going to listen to you because that means you're not paying attention. If you're not strategic, you're not going to get the return on your investment. So, panelists, you guys fucking rock. Thank you. Come on up here, Noah. So Noah's one of our artists that's going to be playing tonight, Mr. Guthrie was born and raised in South Carolina and grew up in a home filled with music. Lots of singing around the house. He credits his dad for teaching him to learn his true voice and hone his gift. And when he was 14, he received his first guitar and started writing songs. As a practice musician on the bass, guitar, and trumpet, by the time he was 13, everyone around, everyone around him knew he had an innate gift. 
His cover of I'm Too Sexy has received 25 million YouTube hits. He has a recur- recurring role in the TV show Glee, and he's open for the likes of Matis Yahoo, Ben Rector, Neon Trees, and Selena Gomez. Ladies and gentlemen, Noah Guthrie. Well, um, hi. <laughs> um, thank you guys for having me up here. Um, I love what you're all saying. You're <laughs> saying such wonderful things. Um, so yeah, uh, as he said, my name is Noah Guthrie. Um, I'm a singer-songwriter, and some of you may have heard of me, but most of you probably not. Um, but just to give you a little bit of a backstory, I kind of got my start on YouTube, um, like a lot of musicians do now. Um, but I started when I was, I don't know, a sophomore in high school, and um, you know, just started posting these cover videos, and uh, I was very lucky that you know people liked it, and, and I had some success. Um, and I will just a small correction: um, I, I had some real big success with a cover of uh, "I'm Sexy and I Know It" by uh, LMFAO. That was my bad. No big deal. Totally fine. Both great songs. <laughs> Not one of those songs that you have to like really get it right every time. Um, but no, um, yeah, so I, I've just been super blessed in, in what's happened to me. And um, I don't know, maybe I can offer some kind of insight on YouTube and, and some social media and stage and all that stuff. So, All right, the floor is officially open for questions. Yeah, I can start with that. I mean, it all goes directly back to everything we've been saying this entire time, which is knowing your art so much that you're able to build a community around it. You know, I personally have seen Marcel play guitar multiple times. I freak out every time. So that's a good start. Play guitar like Marcel. Um, (laughs) When you're done with that, you know, the truth is every musician who didn't have money to spend. And the truth is, if you do have money, you can spend it and you can buy your team if you really want to. And they'll work for you. They're gonna earn their dollars to an extent. What they can actually produce for you has everything to do with what you're giving them to work with. So always start at that core. Look in the mirror, play to yourself. Is this something 100,000 people would enjoy? Very important. You know, after that, finding those people that believe in you. You know, being willing to put yourself out in situations, being here. You're going to talk to tons of people in the industry just because you came out on a Wednesday night. You know, Josh has said, show up. Make sure you're constantly showing up. You know, that's why everybody moves to Nashville. You want to be in one of these towns where you're constantly running across these opportunities. And the truth is, if you're a talented musician, those opportunities will eventually come your way. You know, my dad's joke was always, you're never going to win the lottery if you don't buy the ticket. You know, so put yourself in a place to be found first of all. Um, And after that, you know, sometimes it takes a team of people that believe in you or are willing to work on a percentage knowing that you're a starving artist just like them. And there's a lot of people out there like that. You know, I managed bands for three years uh, before I had to drop it to be full-time at Pisgah and I didn't do it for the money, that's for sure. I did it because I thought these guys deserved someone to speak on their behalf and to speak that language. And from a talent buyer standpoint, if an agent communicates with me or a manager or a publicist, I automatically assume that you're a professional and you have jumped five steps up that ladder in one second. So Marcel is completely right. Those people do speak that language. They know how to speak it well. They know not to waste your time. They know to give you what you need to make your decision. You know, I, my joke as a talent buyer is that buying a band is kind of like buying a house. It's worth what it's worth in the market. Your worth is, is how many people are going to come see you and pay to see you. So developing those statistics, using them as a key, that's what you're going to hand off to, to talk this team into supporting you. You've got to get those numbers. And when the numbers are good, you definitely want to record those. When the numbers are bad, maybe you don't record those. Um, but, but that's how, how you do it. You know, once you get to be an artist making five digits a night, it has absolutely nothing to do with your artistry anymore from the standpoint of talent buying and marketing. It has everything to do with the numbers. And with social media and internet data, we can see the numbers. It tells its own story. You know, but it all, it all starts with you being, being real and playing guitar like Marcel. <laughs> um, I guess I can really speak to um, the, team, the team question that you uh, asked. Um, as a marketing director, I actually have an events team and a promotions team. Um, and I look at what 
the personally what I need to be successful. So, um, you know, my deficits is usually who I hire to. Um, if you have, um, again, money to spend or people in your circle, look to what your deficit is. If you, if you are an amazing artist, but you can also sell yourself, you don't need someone picking up the phone and making the calls. But maybe what you need, again, back to that plan, back to those goals, if at every show you need someone, your main focus might be Facebook or you know whatever that social media is, building your YouTube channel, get someone who knows the app world and the digital footprint, buy yourself an iPad and at your show, set up a kiosk and let that person help drive your numbers right then and there at your show. Let them work the digital marketplace um, the way it needs to be worked. Um, so again, know what your plan is and and what holes you need to fill. Always hire or build your team based on your own personal deficit. You don't want three of you, um, or then you can't be strategic in the marketplace. You want, um, you know, if, if you are soft-spoken and you don't want to represent your brand, but whether it's your partner or your best friend or, you know, a $10 an hour intern. I mean, there's people out there that are hungry, that, that believe in the craft and that are willing to do a amazing things. I've hired some of my best promotions assistants from going through retail or at, you know, a food service, you know, at Michael's in the checkout counter, you strike up a conversation. If that person's outgoing and can talk to you, ask them how much they need to make, you know, to work a show for you and sell your CDs and push your posters and, and make the phone calls. I mean, you know, you, you, you want to play to that person's strength. And then as far as, um, you know, the question that you asked about, you know, different ethnicities and, and that sort of avenue. Again, knowing the marketplace that you're in with Asheville and, you know, whether it's a radio station or a festival, you know, festivals like Goom Bay or Leaf or um, nonprofits that affiliate with different, you know, no matter what ethnicity it is, knowing where those places are and how to get in there is, is huge. Um, you know, and, and, and being able to work that angle, you know, uh, the best that you can. Maybe it's a dance studio who has a musical genre that's in line with what you're looking to do. Go meet that dance instructor. That person probably just does that for a couple hours a week. Where are they going to hear that kind of music? Maybe there's a whole different, um, you know, audience out there that's not mainstream, or maybe it's super mainstream, but just needs a voice. And, and I would certainly use that to your advantage and, and do some research on the street as well as, you know, online and through um, the community at large. I think probably one of the biggest things, if, I mean, if, if, it's, if you're a band, then you've got multiple members, right? So you've kind of got a team already. And I think knowing what you're good at is one thing, but knowing what you're not good at is really good too. Like, you need that. Because if you're good at social media, but the other three guys in the band... They don't have any need for it, then why would you ask them to do it, right? So I, I think maybe a bigger thing too is is back in the 1980s, radio went through this phase of guerrilla marketing, when stations had these horribly nasty battles across markets, like we would be fighting on stage right now, literally in the 80s, we'd be after, wrestling. After the event in the parking lot. Yeah, generally <laughs> after the parking lot. Usually it's Benton's She's fault not too kidding. because he's fueled it up, but. <laughs> Uh, no, it's one of those things where guerrilla marketing, like you've got to look for your niche. Like, is there a marketing opportunity that is coming your way and you just keep missing it, right? It's all about that niche fit. And if you can find that, and again, aligning yourselves with the proper, with the proper groups and with the proper festivals and with the proper charities, you almost can't go wrong. Uh, but I think it's, you know, when it comes down to the overall marketing, you've got to look at it like it's kind of a guerrilla effort to that. You've got to go out and take the streets by storm. You're going to get out of it what you put into it. it and like a, a salesperson, I spent about six months in radio sales. And I realized it was at that point in time that I was probably going to hang myself with a belt from the closet if I had to spend one more day in it. Because I was horrible at it. Cold calling and going to a business and knocking on someone's door... And it's a 98% rejection rate. Like when you're going to sell a product that you can't even tangibly hold, it wasn't for me. But there was another side of the business that I was really good at. 
And that's where I've been for the last 18 years. So it's about knowing your niche and knowing your strengths, but knowing your weaknesses and then finding those key players to fill those weaknesses in. Just kind of like repeating everything that everybody else has set up here tonight. It all comes back to knowing what you're good at and being good at it. Uh, yeah, I can say a little something to that. Um, I feel like I should be sitting in those seats, though. Um, but, uh, you know, I personally, I do have a team uh, of sorts. I've got, you know, a manager, a booking agent, a publicist. Um, you know, I have multiple promoters overseas, which I guess um, something that kind of goes back to setting goals and kind of knowing where you want to be and how you want to get there. Um, so a few years ago, uh, you know, with YouTube and with almost every social media tool now, you have analytics and breakdowns of, you know, where your demographic is and, you know, 20-year-olds to 50-year-olds like you in this country. So you kind of know where you have a hot spot. And uh, for a while, um, we wanted to get over into Europe because I knew I had a bunch of fans just sitting and waiting basically um, for me to go over there and you know it was just never really in the cards money wise so you know we finally decided well we want to just do it no matter what um, you know so I had a booking agent that booked me here and um, we said hey do you know anybody in Europe that you would want to correspond with and we would want to correspond with to put together some kind of tour over there and he said yeah I've got this guy who's actually a kid, really, he's like 20 years old, but um, this kid that's in the Netherlands who just is doing a great job booking shows there, and, and he's filling rooms for singer-songwriters, uh, you know, at my level, and we're like, okay, great, let's talk to him, so we talked to him and brought him on, um, you know, all basically non-exclusive things, because it's usually just when we're over there that we need them, so um, anyway, what ended up happening uh we did a netherlands tour went fantastic because we had you know two or three people over there promoting the hound out of the shows and um you know just really getting the word out and booking really good venues um so i don't know i, I do think uh when you can find the right people to add on to your team when it makes sense uh it definitely helps um you know all those shows over there were pretty much sold out so it was just you know, everyone kind of coming on board at the right time and having those right people who know way more than you in a certain area help you out. Yes, sir. <laughs> what he asked was, uh, he's a music collector himself, quite knowledgeable on diverse amounts of music and wanted to know how he would get in a position uh, like someone up here who may not be an actual artist but would work within the industry utilizing their passion for music. Sound good? All right. Um, yeah. I mean, that's exactly what I did. I, you know, went to a festival when I was 16. It was like, Pow! And so uh, I went and targeted many people. I mean, I actually met the person who introduced me, my first business partner, in the parking lot of a Watch for a Panic concert. Um, and uh, haggled him about his VIP pass, how I could get one of those. And um, turns out I, he was working with the Festival Smile Fest, which was an event that I was already a patron of. Um, you know, and just thinking of that story, like you can imagine yourself in these moments where you're meeting someone and you're, you're intrigued and the conversation's flowing and you guys have a lot in common. Well, when you find yourself in a position of, again, showing up, being somewhere in a room full of industry folks, and you're having that conversation, always be willing to follow up. You know, your passion is your job. Of course, everyone wants to do that. But that window is right there as much as you just continue to be focused and confident about what you're doing. You know, once I got into working at events, I, I more kind of gained respect just from being a hard worker. You know, I was putting up tents and rolling out fence and filling up a van full of gear and going to the next hippie fest. Uh, but eventually it turned into organizing our own events and setting our own standards. Uh, and from there, that's when, when talent buying comes into play. And when you have that opportunity, you know, whether it's a small budget or a big budget, you can surprise people with the quality of music that you know and that you're able to find. And that's a true skill set. And that's where talent buyers come from. 
Uh, Jeff Whitworth, the gentleman who books this room, has booked, former owner, probably one of the best in the business in the Southeast, in my opinion, very nice guy, and probably the most knowledgeable person of the music that he's booking uh, of anyone I've met as a talent buyer. Some talent buyers, like I said, the industry is a lot about numbers. They're looking at numbers, they know what to expect, they're going to hit the AAA stations, they're going to try to get those numbers, but sometimes having that abstract knowledge that's exactly what you want. So then it's about knowing your window, knowing your opportunity, and trying to find those options of, hey, maybe there's a club going out of business that needs a talent buyer. Sometimes you got to be willing to be a starving artist even if you're not playing a guitar. You know, I definitely did it for a long time. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say knowing, knowing your passion and, and being confident that that can also be valuable to someone. And don't, don't let someone tell you no and let it stop you because you're going to get told no over and over again just let just let it roll off i mean you're a dude like we've been getting told no by you know our entire lives so it shouldn't be a big deal but seriously if you if you love what if you have an idea and you're confident that this is a good idea i think all of us up here have probably had this i know i was told no the first time that i wanted to do something so badly by people who are making the decision and I was like okay well I'm going to ask again later and then you do it for free for long until you can make money at it but it's not easy but man if that's what you want to do then you network don't let no tell you, stop you and and just keep keep at it you know do something to pay the bills and then show up at night somewhere you know you're going to have two jobs this is a two job town if you want to do what you love Another idea in that same vein is we have so many music festivals here. Um, like he was talking about Jeff Whitworth. He books for um, Asheville Downtown Association and Downtown After Five. So, um, again, I'll go West Fest or Downtown After Five or, um, you know, any of these festivals that are usually nonprofit driven have multiple acts. You might tag team yourself with one of those guys and find out, hey, can I just shadow you for a season and get a feel for they have a different job, too, because they're probably volunteering. Um, how to get your foot in the door and the process that they go through um, to execute that kind of job. Do you have a business card? Yeah. Step one. <laughs> you also have a really small little um, area there that you, you, you immediately said you're into the spoken word, right? Well, there's something that's not in, it's not everywhere. Right? So you've automatically narrowed the field. So maybe you need to be thinking, you know, take a different tact on this and say, maybe I need to be collecting as many spoken word artists as I can find, right? And bring them under your umbrella that way. So, you know, having, having that very narrow little focus can be a real benefit to you. So. Yeah, you, you've just made yourself valuable to people by having access to folks that I don't know how to book a spoken word artist or a, you know, a flamenco dancer. You might. So who am I going to call? I just met you. You have a business card. Fuck it. What's your number? You know, that's that's literally how these things happen. And to think otherwise is is folly. You know, just show up. Yes, sir. Is there more room for urban music and hip hop in Asheville? I would certainly like to think so. I, this used to be like an underground hip hop mecca. And it's a like late 90s, early 2000s atmosphere, gift of gab. Before a lot of people knew these label, quantum label guys were coming through, uh, the rhyme sayers were coming through. So, and, and again, you know, you're dealing with certain types of urban music, well, there's a huge wide swath of their own subgenres, obviously. Um, so yes, that's obviously there. You know, a again with any market, whether it's a flamenco dancer, spoken word, you got to know your community. You know, and if you have the people, everybody's going to open their doors. That's all we're all trying to do. We're trying to get everybody in the doors. So if you have the people first, people will give you a room. You know. Yeah. So the answer is absolutely yes. Remember, Asheville goes from bluegrass to Bob Moog with most things in between. So there's really not, that's another awesome part about this town. It's, 
it has the potential to embrace every, I mean, every single genre is here. We're just a smaller market. You guys want to talk about the impact of uh, the urban music on a national scene versus local scene? I mean, it's a pretty commercially viable genre. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think if you're not seeing it on a local level, I think you just set your first goal for yourself, right? Create the umbrella. Yeah, and, and maybe, maybe that's your goal is to help expand that umbrella a little bit more and, and bring the awareness that these artists are out here, right? And, and that there is a vibrant scene here in Asheville. You know, a lot of times it goes back to the path might not be blazed for you. You're probably going to have to knock some people out of the way and knock some things out of the way and create your own path, right? And, you know, from my perspective, if an artist has a great story behind them, that's part of the sell for me. I mean, that's part of the reason I want to bring somebody in on the morning show is because they've got a really fantastic story behind them as well. So, you know, I think ingratiating yourself and helping grow the scene, again, if, you, if, it's, if the scene is not as big as what you want it to be, there's your first goal. Make it that big. Huh, we're here. <laughs> you should have been at the Asheville Music Hall on Tuesday night if you weren't after Diggable Planets last week. It was packed. Yeah. You might remember you it, that at, at, at one time, Asheville was a bubbling R&B and soul town. There was a, all the artists would, would roll through this town. Uh, you know, it's been decades, but that doesn't mean that there isn't a consumer audience available for the stuff. So right. absolutely, man, this is, you know, it's your oyster. You can, you know, if you Tuesday want to make it happen, jam. step out. Yeah. I'll tell you another thing. Go down to Oliver Twist on a Saturday night, and there's a woman that sings with the 42nd Street Jazz Band. She was singing studio originals for Aretha, for Aretha to practice with when she was on tour, right? So she was singing demos for Aretha. Nobody knows, nobody knows this. Go pick her brain, right? Find musicians that have been successful, right? And just pick their brains. Be absolutely aggressive about it. And you'll, they'll give you the answers that you want because the fact is, is that marketing, we may have more tools now, but it hasn't changed since 1960. The goal is still the same. Get the music out there, get the people in the door, right? I mean, that's, that's what everybody's here for. Do you have a business card? Yeah. <laughs> Step one. That's right. And also, um, you might, from a local level, try to tag team on um, when the Orange Peel has big hip-hop shows, which they do bring, like, for example, Diggable Planets last week. I mean, try to have the after-party show. Be the promoter for the after-party. All those people were looking for a place to go. And, I mean, that's right. Find the window. Anything? And this young lady here and then this gentleman here. And then we got two more questions after this one. Um, in terms of, I, I see all this money coming into Asheville with tourism dollars, and I don't see it making it to uh, the very vibrant music community that we have here. Um, what are you guys working on, and what can we be working on to make that happen better? Questions? So, uh, that's a big question. Um, <laughs> For those that didn't hear it, uh, there's a lot of tourism dollars coming into town that a lot of artists aren't seeing. And I think if you've played a gig in this town, it's hard to make a living just on gigging here. Um, I've, when I moved here in 2007, I came straight from Austin, Texas. I had a weekly gig. I would play monthly. Um, I was bartending and doing shit for free so I could get on people's radars. Um, what are we doing? AMP is trying to elevate the profile of the music scene so that civic entities can see and be made very clearly aware of the divide that exists, that if you're going to effectively fly the flag of the arts to attract tourist dollars, that you need to be aware that this is a difficult town for artists to subside on their art. We are very conscious of that, and it's, it's, a, it's a hard, it's a difficult road to hoe, but that is one of our tenets, is to be engaged with them. And we are working to do an economic impact study and have been asked to um, help 
craft that so that there can be some metrics that are presented publicly about what kind of money and dollars are being brought to bear by the music industry itself. And that includes artists, venues, luthiers, music shops, studios, booking agents, as much as an all-inclusive angle. And the young lady behind you, Ms. Jess Thomason, who is our executive director of AMP, has been very instrumental in that and has spearheaded a lot of this work. So if you see her, buy her water. Um, or maybe a margarita. But seriously, it's, it's a tough question, and, and thank you for asking that. Um, yeah, to tie into that, AMP is currently partnering with uh, the Asheville Convention and Visitors Bureau, which is basically the major tourism arm of, you know, our city's marketing arm to tourism. Uh, and we're kind of changing the brand from from the beer city mode to music city. So actually they just recently had a huge rollout this spring for brand new website. It's basically highlighting every single venue in town. Um, so what you're speaking of is certainly something that's highlighted to everybody in the industry as far as how do we do that. There's 11 million people coming here uh, on an annual basis, but also you gotta keep in mind there's only 90,000 of us who actually stay here and live here. And there's how many clubs? There's a lot of clubs. You're, you're There's a lot of places to play to 30 music, clubs. which is and a how beautiful many thing. Of those 90,000 people are going out, spending money, going to shows, or supporting the right. industry. Right. And how many tourists are coming, you know, and spending those dollars directly? Well, just like with the Beer City Initiative, we tried to convince them: Hey, if you're touring in Asheville, then perhaps you're here for a hike, perhaps you're here for a convention, perhaps you're here for a concert. But you should definitely visit one of the 29 breweries within a 30 mile radius because that's part of our culture and, and our experience. So right now, what AMP is doing, what the Convention Visitors Bureau and what I fully support is that same initiative. Don't come to Asheville without checking out the local music scene, without stepping in the door of a local club and seeing the talent and the artistry that we have available. Um, so this is a direct community standard question of we're all in it together and, and how do we constantly promote that? You promote it by making it a thing. Oh, you just came to Asheville and you didn't go see a show? And, and the, more, the more you folks show up to these events and learn to, to streamline your craft and to get it out there, we already have a vibrant music scene. The talent pool here is infinite. We've, we've gone over that ad nauseum. It's really a, a lovely thing. It's uh, just, it's awesome. If we can all, that's what AMP is trying to do, is to make it better by providing these educational tools and resources, and then instead of having to worry about tourists funding and paying our bills, maybe we get a couple booking agents who are booking, who are taking Asheville artists and sending them out on tour across the country. And these booking agents are, are based here. More tangible music industry entities like record labels, booking agencies, talent buyers, based here in Asheville who are mining the talent here. And so the, the better we do as artists to put our craft and our art out there, the more the rest of the country is going to be like, shit, let's move our business to Asheville, you know, and then mine that talent. And then that's, that's one way. But it's, it's really difficult. You're right. And, and thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, I have one last question, and then remember we got we got Noah Guthrie and Mayfield. What's yeah, uh, Matthew Mayfield. Matthew Girl. Mayfield. Yeah, yeah. So you can Fantastic. you guys can get your uh, hand stamped and um, and stick around for the show. Can you talk about how how do you get twenty five million views of, on your YouTube? <laughs> That's I mean even uh, <laughs> even just to start, guys. There's so many tools out there for, on social media. What'd you do to sort of kick that off? Um. Man, okay, so talk about a tough question. Uh, basically, with me, what happened is I started putting out these videos. I, I basically started doing cover videos of whatever was top 40 at the time, and sometimes, you know, classics and stuff like that, too. Um, but, you know, when I started, it, it was covering anything that was you know, poppy and, and on the radio all the time, but my main goal was to twist it and not really, I made, basically I made a lot of, you know, really fun pop songs very depressing. 
and people liked it. Um, or I made them very like bluesy and soulful and, and people liked it. And um, as far as you know, views and stuff go, I, I would say the best, you know, you know, the best thing that, that, that I've done is literally just posting content consistently. Um, and I'm not the poster child for that recently because I've been on the road so much. But um, the way everything started building was, you know, every Wednesday, every Thursday, I was posting a new video. Everyone knew about it because I would blast social media until they did know and, you know, tuned in at Thursday at midnight or whenever I was posting. Um, and uh, just to repeat again what everyone else has said, um, you know, just try to be the best at what you're doing. Um, I think a lot of it, for, for me, all my videos and stuff on YouTube are all live takes. They're all run through Pro Tools and, and sound great, um, but they're all me in front of a microphone and a guitar and singing until I have the right take. It takes me 12 to 20 takes sometimes on a song that I either don't like or I'm just not good at playing. Um, but, you know, it, it takes that commitment to kind of get that product. And uh, I don't know, I think kind of, I think maybe that honesty of when you're watching one of my videos, you may see me make a mistake or you may, you know, see a wrong lyric, but I'm trying to sing those with as much passion as I can, as much emotion as I can. Um, and I guess that resonates with some people. And um, <laughs> when it comes to like sexy and I know it and stuff, I don't know. That was completely out of the blue. I was really, really behind on putting a cover up and was playing a blues riff and decided to sing uh, wiggle, 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 yeah, over the top of it. <laughs> and it just kind of worked, and it blew up the next day, and it did a lot of really cool stuff for me. But um, I think one of the, the weirdest questions I get is, you know, how do you go viral, and, like, how do you make a viral video? Well, there really isn't a way that I've found to make one. You just kind of kind of falls into place if you have something that's really cool and, you know, people enjoy Yes, absolutely. You and then we got it. These are the last two guys. We got to wrap it up so these guys can play. You're you're already over time. <laughs> That's one way of going about it. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> Come on up here and ask me yourself, man. Sorry. Thank you, guys.